Okay, so we have a few things left to do. So we have one more uh, topic in the in the area of bioseparations, which was I talked about emerging technologies. If you look at the timetable, isn't that it says emerging therapeutics twice? Um, but I did have a lecture on emerging therapeutics, and I was going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, cell therapies, about viruses, virus-like particles. I think what I'll do is I'm going to do that tomorrow morning. And I'm going to switch to this one, which was what was supposed to be tomorrow. I'm going to start on this, which is these biomedical devices. And that will help you to answer one of the homework problems on uh, membrane blood oxygenators. And then after that, tomorrow we will finish this. We'll do the, the, the emerging therapeutics, and then we're almost done. Okay. So if you look at this, uh, in this area of, uh, of membranes for biomedical applications, so now we've changed a bit from bioseparations. Uh, there are the following that, that we were going to talk about. One is blood oxygenators, which I'll talk about now. We can use microfiltration, exactly what I've talked about so far, for something called cell washing, specifically washing red blood cells, and I'll talk about that. Um, then there's a process called plasmapheresis. So I'm going to explain that probably sometime tomorrow, but I'm not going to go into too many details because really you know all the theory now for for tangential flow microfiltration, and that's what plasmapheresis basically is if you're using a membrane. Uh, there was a, a lecture on dialysis that I think Dr. Noel Jacob has given. He talked about hemodialysis, the same as dialysis, okay? Um, I, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about hemofiltration, which is uh, an ultrafiltration process, okay? So that's what's going to be covered here. All right. So let's talk about blood oxygenators, because one of the questions asks you to compare the blood oxygenator to the human lung and asks you what are the differences and the similarities. So a blood oxygenator is used during open heart surgery. Okay, And so in open heart surgery, here's the patient. You want to operate on the heart. And if it is severe, you need to cut open the patient and stop the heart from beating. Okay. If you stop the heart from beating, you need to make sure the patient is alive. So you've got to get oxygen to the brain, basically. That's the most important thing, but actually to the whole body. Because these procedures, if they're severe, can take up to six hours. Okay, uh, Hopefully not so long. But anyway, the brain needs oxygen within three minutes. Okay, Other parts of the body maybe can manage a little bit longer, but not six hours. So here's what happens. You basically take blood. Uh, so the blood is coming back. Uh, if you if you know how the heart works, it's coming back into the into the into the vena cava. You take the blood from there, okay, and you basically uh, pump it, as you can see here. It comes out from the patient like this. Now there are lots of reservoirs and things, okay, because one of the things you can't do is pump air into the patient. So you need to have reservoirs where you have holding volumes in case the pressure drops suddenly and so forth. So that immediately brings up one problem with blood oxygenation, and that is typically you need blood transfusion because you've increased the total blood, the, 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 the volume of this whole external circuit now needs to be filled with blood besides whatever your blood vessel volume is, right? And so if you don't do that, uh, you don't have enough liquid volume. Now what they do typically in blood oxygenation is they dilute the blood. So you add uh, anticoagulants and so forth. But you can only dilute up to a point, because if you dilute too much, the concentration of red blood cells falls too low, and then you can't transfer oxygen fast enough to the, to the brain. Okay? So all of us have a hematocrit, maybe about 35-40%, something like this. You can dilute to about 25%, but if you go much below that, it becomes a problem. Okay? So you may need a blood transfusion. The hope is not to. So it comes through here through a blood pump, and this is a peristaltic pump. Okay? It's shown there, but it's designed so that the occlusion here is such that you, you squash the red blood cell, but you don't damage it, because red blood cells are flexible. Okay? And then from there, it goes here to a membrane blood oxygenator, which is a microporous membrane okay, that is hydrophobic. So it's hydrophobic. So, so far, microfiltration membranes, we've talked about hydrophilic or hydrophilized PDV, PVDF. Here, you are typically using polypropylene. That's hydrophobic. So blood passes on one side, and typically people are using hollow fibers these days. Blood passes on one side, 
but the membrane pores remain air-filled because it is hydrophobic. The blood will not wet the membrane pores unless you put a very high pressure. And so we don't run at high pressure. We just run through the outside the fibers at low pressure. You run gas on the other side, typically a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and so forth. Okay, And that ratio can be varied depending on the patient's blood oxygenation level. And then oxygen will diffuse from the gas through the air-filled membrane pores into the blood and carbon dioxide the other way. So that's how it works. That's a membrane blood oxygenator. And from there, it comes back through here. It goes through this cardiotomy reservoir, a few other things here. Um, this is a new thing that's done, cell salvage, if you're trying to salvage cells, anyway, to collection bag and back into the patient, okay? So that's how it works, all right? This is actually a very complicated system, and uh, the perfusionist really has to watch many, many things, okay? Carbon dioxide levels and so forth. That's a simplified uh, description of the whole thing, okay? Um, sorry. Okay, so here are some blood oxygenators. Um, I, I think I mentioned uh, at the start of this class that this, actually my PhD thesis was on de designing blood oxygenators, but this was a very big thing. So th let's talk about the history of blood oxygenators actually briefly. So the first procedure was done a long, long time ago, I think around the late 1940s. It was done in Minnesota in the US, and uh, it, was, it was basically not successful and people didn't really know much about doing this whole procedure. So a surgeon decided to do this because his patient was dying. Anyway, the early blood oxygenators were designed on good chemical engineering principles. You had blood coming out of the body. It flowed across a film. So imagine a plastic film, and it was in contact with the air. So you want a very large gas-liquid interface for good transfer, right? And then it goes back into the body. The problem with that, though, is you can't sterilize that, OK? So all of the pathogens that are floating around in the air get into the blood. And so these film oxygenators, they worked. And uh, certainly the surgery was successful, but the patients usually died of infection, OK? So the, the success rate was very, very low, OK? So that was the end of that. Uh, then uh, about, the, I guess, the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, people came up with a different idea. And these were these so-called bubble oxygenators, because by then, the, the, towards, I guess, the early 70s, there was a better idea of what had to be done to sterilize things, how you could run in a sterile manner, and so forth, okay? And you cannot possibly sterilize this open film. So these bubble oxygenators used very good chemical engineering principles. So here's the blood. It comes into a, into a reservoir like we saw in the previous one, and you bubble oxygen through it, right? Very good gas-liquid transfer. You can run the oxygen through a... a, a um, microfiltration membrane to remove any, any, any uh, microbes that are present, and you can bubble it. So, so sterility wasn't such a big concern anymore. That, that could be taken care of, but they didn't work very well. And again, the patients tended to not always, they did better, but not that well. And the reason was, if you're bubbling air in blood, there is tremendous damage, okay? I told you earlier, proteins do not like gas-liquid interfaces. Well, plasma has a lot of proteins. There are plasma proteins, clotting factors. You activate these clotting factors. You activate platelets. You know, when you cut yourself, you stop bleeding, right? Because the platelets and other things contact air, and that starts a whole clotting cascade. I mean, unless you're a hemophiliac or something, it, it does that. So again, you're inducing all of this, right? And so you had to find ways to suppress it. So again, not particularly successful, but better than before. And probably towards the end of the, uh, maybe the early 80s, or end of the 70s, early 80s, people came up with this idea of using dense membranes, not microporous membranes, dense membranes, and they use silicon rubber. So silicon rubber has a very, very high oxygen permeability. So it's a very nice membrane. You use this, you've got an absolute barrier, so there's no gas-liquid interface. Oxygen transfers in very well. This is working quite well, but there's a problem. Because oxygen goes in very well, but actually you can't control carbon dioxide removal. And the body is actually very carefully regulated. We also have to exhale carbon dioxide, OK? But again, it's interesting, if you take out too much carbon dioxide, there's a problem also, because you change the blood pH, because carbon dioxide in water forms carbonic acid, okay? So this all has to be carefully regulated. So the problem with these uh, um, film, uh, these dense film oxygenators, these uh, silicon rubber oxygenators, was that you didn't have good control of carbon dioxide removal. So again, there were complications, okay? 
And then the idea of using microporous, microfiltration membranes, perhaps developed in conjunction with the biotechnology industry. So early, mid 80s, they started coming around. And really by the end of the 80s, uh, they were starting to displace silicon rubber and bubble oxygenators. And the idea was now we had the technology to make these microporous membranes, either flat sheet or hollow fiber. And uh, this is an example of a flat sheet one. This is a hollow fiber one. And actually, what you see here is, um, what you see here, this part of it is actually a heat exchanger. And uh, this part here is actually also a heat exchanger. And this is the membrane oxygenator. Why do you need heat exchange? Well, you know, your body is what, 37 something, 38 degrees Celsius. You've got this whole thing running around an outside loop, and the operating theater is not running at 37 degrees Celsius. So there is tremendous heat loss. So the patient's going to die because there's no way the body can keep, keep this going. So you have to heat the blood, okay? You have to put heat input. So this is actually a very, very complicated system. So that's how these oxygenators came about. And they're very nice because with a microporous membrane, this is becoming more like the, the lungs now, right? You have uh, very small pores, oxygen can go in, carbon dioxide can come out. You can artificially control the carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen level in the air you're pumping around this. It works well, okay? So that's how these came about, and that's how they're designed. Uh, sorry, let me go on. So, uh, blood oxygenators provide extracorporeal support. You want to design them so that they last for up to six hours. So there is fouling in these devices because even though you do all this, you see proteins will still adsorb onto a hydrophobic membrane. So you will get some protein damage. You will get fouling. Eventually, you'll get leakage. Blood will go directly into the gas side. But you want it to last for six hours, and then you throw it away. Now, this is a device also one-time use, okay? You don't reuse these. However, it's even more strict than the biotech industry because this time, so biotech industry, I told you, at the end, you have to validate your virus filter and make sure it worked. And if it didn't work, you've got a major problem. In a blood oxygenator, if it doesn't work, the patient's going to die. So the, everyone has to work. So it has to be tested before it is shipped. Okay, so that's why they're quite expensive. Okay. Uh, it's basically what we call a gas liquid contactor in chemical engineering terms. And uh, it's a very good example of a gas liquid contactor. Older film and bubble oxygenators I talked about today, mainly flat sheet and hollow fibers. And actually today it's mainly hollow fibers. And the reason it's hollow fibers is if you have the fibers and you pump outside the fibers, you induce mixing. So you prevent concentration polarization. In flat sheets, you have to put a spacer. You can do that, but that increases the volume of the device. The larger the volume, the more likely you are to need more blood transfusion. So you want to minimize the volume. So that's why all the fibers tend to be used today. So these are the design criteria. You want to maximize gas transfer, okay? Because you want the gas transferring quickly. That will minimize your priming volume. Minimizing priming volume, minimizing blood transfusion. That's very important. You want to minimize the membrane surface area because that's actually the most important component. And you want to minimize blood damage. So you can see the design criteria are quite different, say, for water treatment, where it will be minimized cost. So cost doesn't appear there. Those are the major concerns, OK? Um, OK, before I go on to mass transfer equations, let's talk about this. So now, if you're designing a blood oxygenator, and you think of the human lungs, so what are the differences? So the lungs actually are very, very high surface area, right? If you take out your lungs and you try to spread them out or take any spread it out, a huge surface area packed into a very small volume. But in this, we are trying to minimize the surface area. So there's one difference in the design. We're not trying to copy nature. We want to minimize the amount of membrane area we use because I told you that is the most expensive part. That's one reason, but there's another reason you are bringing the blood in contact with an artificial surface. And the more contact there is, the more blood damage there will be, however hard you try. So you want to minimize that. So that's one big difference, OK? OK. Second difference is that uh, you want to minimize the priming volume because you're adding a whole lot of extra circuitry, right? Whereas in the body, that's not a problem because you have a blood volume that matches the size of the patient and so forth, OK? So, so that's not a problem. Another thing is that uh, in the blood, if you, if you know how the lungs work, the, the red blood cells go through smaller and smaller capillaries in the alveoli, and they go through this very, very slowly. And so there's plenty of time. The residence time is quite long for oxygen to transfer in, carbon dioxide to transfer out. 
In these, you want to do it very quickly. You want to maximize gas transfer. So you actually want to pump as fast as you can without damaging blood and be consistent with pumping by the ara blood around the body because actually if you look at mass transfer correlations, the faster you pump, the higher the rate of mass transfer. Okay? The, the, the convective uh, mass transfer coefficient, like a heat transfer coefficient, depends upon the velocity in the outside. Okay? So you do want to do a fast, you don't want to go slowly. Okay? However, you have to be careful to minimize blood damage. So you want to pump fast, but you want to, not minim but you want to minimize blood damage. Okay? Um, so what else can we say are differences between the, the lungs and the, and the, the body and, and, and these blood oxygenators? Another thing. So the lungs, actually, the, 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 the red blood cells pass through these very, very thin capillaries, but nevertheless, they do provide a small, very, very thin barrier between the gas and the red blood cells, okay? And then the, red, the, the, the oxygen diffuses through this barrier. In the blood oxygenator, actually, there are microporous, there are pores, so there is contact. Okay, this is all sterilized, but there is contact, so there is some blood damage, but it's minimized. Okay, so the body is better; the body is able to avoid this. Okay, and then there are other things. I mean, in the body, you can control your rate of breathing depending upon how much you're exercising and so forth. All of these control systems, of course, don't work. Okay, so one of the questions there is comparing blood, uh, a lung, with a blood oxygenator. So, and you can think of other things, but those are some of the main things to think about. But think about if you were designing this. Um, what, what are the differences? Because it's an example where typically we say in, in uh, biomedical devices, we want to copy nature, but that's not always true. We want to copy the functional part of it, but we may not copy the design. Okay, the design might be quite different. Okay, let me move on then. What's the time? We said we'll stop at 4.15, right? Okay, 10 minutes more, good. So, um, the way we try to uh, analyze the, the, the the mass transfer is we use these equations where the, the flux, this time it's called N, is equal to a mass transfer coefficient multiplied by concentration driving force. So those of you that are chemical engineers, this should be very obvious. Those of you who are not, uh, just uh, let me try and explain it as qualitatively as I can. So this is the flux, this is like J in the previous ones, okay? And this is just a, a, like a explaining the rate of mass transfer in terms of the differences in concentration. And we can actually write the mass transfer coefficient as the, the volumetric flow rate divided by area multiplied by the log of these terms, C1 and C0 and C star. So C star is what would be in equilibrium, the equilibrium concentration, okay? And then C1 and C0 are the concentrations uh, in, the, in the blood oxygenator, the entrance and the outlet. And so this gives you a sort of driving force. It tells you what concentration I have and what I would have if I were in equilibrium, okay? So for those of you that have not studied this, it is a little more complicated than microfiltration because you've got a gas-liquid uh, interface and so you've got to get an equivalent concentration in the gas to the liquid. So we use partition coefficients, things like this, okay? That's why it's a bit more complicated, okay? But basically it's looking at a driving force. Um, let me move on. Okay, so they are flat sheet and hollow fibers. Uh, this is a typical flat sheet oxygenator. I don't think they're used much anymore. Uh, they're used actually for children, for pediatric uh, ac applications. The flat sheet is a nice because it can be very compact. And for, you know, especially for very young, like neonates, uh, blood volume is critical because they don't have much blood, okay? So typically you have this crimped sheet. So this is, this is the membrane that's going like this. The blood flows on this side and the back side is going to be where the gas flows and you've got to put spacers to include induced mixing, okay? Uh, so what we can do typically when we analyze these is that we do what we call mass transfer correlations where we correlate something called the Sherwood number, so I hope some of you know what the Sherwood number is, versus things like Gratz number or Reynolds number and things like this. So, so engineers like to work with things called dimensionless numbers. Okay, if you think of it, what these dimensionless numbers try to do is try to allow you to compare different systems without having to worry about the physical dimensions. So you've taken the physical dimensions, you've normalized it, and then you can plot it. So this is another way of saying, uh, this is my rate of oxygen transfer as a function of flow rate. But if I have different modules with different surface areas and different lengths and flow paths, it's difficult to compare them. So this is making it normalized. 
All I want to say is this. So this is actually work that we had done, or I had done quite some time ago. And uh, what I'm showing you is this, that see, this is a prediction that we have. And then this is data for a Newtonian blood analog one, two, three, and for blood. So just like uh, in, in the biotech industry working with viruses, if you're going to do this and you're going to work with human blood, it's a bit difficult because you're not going to have a, somebody's going to donate all their blood, okay, to, to test these, it's, it's impossible. So what are the models we use? So typically people use sheep blood, they use bovine blood. The reason they use these is because these red blood cells, these animals' red blood cells, are very similar to human red blood cells in terms of size and flexibility. And that's important to look at gas transfer and so forth. However, it's still complicated, so what we did is we worked with uh, a Newtonian fluid, basically water and glycerol, and we tried to come up with the same rheological properties as blood, and then we plucked these here, and the red dots are for blood. So what I tried to show you is that typically we can work with models that, that give you a good way of doing this. And this is important actually if you're working in the biotech industry, any of these industries, to come up with models that give good reproducibility and, and represent the actual system. So that's what that's about, okay? Um, I will not, I, when I was preparing these, I wasn't, I, I was under the impression that everyone was from engineering, but they're not. So let me just say that uh, with the mass transfer coefficient, we derive this uh, expansion. So usually it's not so complicated. This expansion accounts for the fact that we talked about this earlier. Membranes don't have uniform pores, right? They have a pore size distribution. So we tried to account for that because that's good. And, and that's why we have that curved line in the previous one, okay? Um, so has anyone seen this correlation before? I'm just curious to know. This sort of Sherwood number being a Gratz number to the one third power. Nobody has seen it before? Okay, so that's interesting. So this is a classical, uh, actually a heat transfer correlation for uh, developing a concentration flow profile in either tubes or flat, uh, flat planes, okay? So this is called the Gratz solution. There's a so-called Nassault solution for heat transfer. This is the mass transfer analog. You may have heard of the heat transfer one. But anyway, uh, it just tells the Sherwood number, which is a mass transfer coefficient divided by diffusion coefficient, and this is some sort of characteristic dimension is equal to a Gratz number, which is given by here, the characteristic mention, kinematic viscosity, and so forth, okay? Uh, length and, and uh, diffusion coefficient. Uh, sometimes you see this in terms of a Reynolds number and, uh, and uh, a Prandtl number, okay? Okay, so let's look at this. This is the design of a, of a hollow fiber uh, blood oxygenator which actually I told you is more common today. So the liquid typically comes from a central core. And these fibers are actually wrapped around the central core. And what is more, they are knitted. So the fibers are spaced very carefully and you have some sort of a thread that knits them together. So it's like clothing, okay? And the reason you do that is now you have a very, uh, very carefully uh, set pattern of fibers, okay? They are very uniform. That's important because the flow channel is uniform, so you have equal gas transfer, okay? And the fibers act as turbulence promoters. They cause mixing. So the blood is flowing on the outside, oxygen is flowing on the inside of the fibers that are coiled around this central core. And the blood comes in, it flows across this fiber mat, and it's collected and then taken out and back to the patient, okay? Um, Okay, these are mass transfer correlations for hollow fiber blood oxygenators. So again, a Sherwood number, a Reynolds number, and a Schmidt number, you must have, somebody must have seen one of these correlations, right? So Schmidt number, a Prandtl number, and heat transfer, okay? But I won't go into the details, that's just a way of correlating data, which I'm going to show you soon. Oh, and I need to show you one more set of equations, and then that's it, I think. So okay, those of you who are not chemical engineers, but are more into life sciences, but I don't think there is anybody here, unfortunately, should know this very clearly. So there is a complication when you're talking about blood. When you're talking about, uh, you know, mass transfer into water, into proteins, into glycerol, that's fine. Uh, blood is more complex, right? You've got red blood cells, and red blood cells are designed to catch oxygen. In fact, you've got four hemoglobin units, right? And so there is this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve that's very important, all right? So basically, hemoglobin plus oxygen it's a reversible reaction, you form oxyhemoglobin. And then there's this saturation curve because it's a bit more complicated. It's a, it's a Freundlich isotherm. So those of you that know about isotherms, uh, 
you know, when the first heme, when the first oxygen joins a heme unit, actually there's a stronger driving force for the second and the third. But when you get close to the fourth, it drops off again. And that maintains your blood saturation. It's meant to maintain it around 90, 95%, something like that, okay? So you need to take that into account when you're designing this, because clearly, if you're just looking at oxygen diffusing into water, you're going to get very different results, okay? So that's why we started looking at these, uh, these curves. And we came up, therefore, with a modified mass transfer coefficient that accounts for all of this oxygen uh, binding to hemoglobin, okay? If you're interested in the mathematics of this, I can describe it. I'm just giving an idea of how you would try to do these calculations. And so then we can uh, look at uh, integrating this and so forth. And so here the typical test system where, and this is done in industry a lot. So you have one blood oxygenator here, a second one here, okay? So with this one, I made it simple. You're running oxygen through here, so you're oxygenating the blood here. Here you run nitrogen, you deoxygenate it. So it's basically trying to, and, and typically you'd run bovine blood or sheep blood, something like this. So when you're testing these, you know, if you, if you couldn't deoxygenate it, you'd oxygenate it, and then what do you do? I mean, you're finished, right? You, you can't do much more. But clearly, uh, and, and you know, you know the, the, the sheep is dead, it's not running, right? The blood is just sitting there. So you've got to deoxygenate somehow. And so you can run a system like this, where you're oxygenating in the one hand and deoxygenating by running nitrogen on the other hand, other side, and you can run this, and that's typically how people design these blood oxygenators, come up with new membranes. Think of a lot of things to do here, the membrane pore size, the membrane, the flow channel, the, the biocompatibility of these membranes, there's quite a lot to design in these, okay? Um, and so, how many minutes? Okay, I'll stop. Let me see. I'll do a couple more and I'll stop. So, uh, this is just some of the work we did where we looked at different 100% water, 20% glycerol, 40% glycerol. They were basically blood analog fluids that we investigated. And um, uh, these are some of the, the, the features of these blood oxygenators. So, this one, this COB VPCML Plus is a flat sheet polypropylene membrane, 50 plus or minus 5 microns thin. The blood channels are 230 micron. The Corb Duo, you can see, uh, has slightly different blood channels. So the blood channels are 160. They're smaller. Smaller blood channels actually mean you can pack, pack more density in there, more area there, so you can end up with a smaller unit, right? But if you get too small, you'll have to start to have blood damage because of higher shear stresses on the blood. And then uh, this is a, a two compartment system, uh, and you can see one is 0.4 meters squared, one is 0.85 meters squared. This is for very, very small children under, say, four years of age, and this is for children about 10 years of age, and that's for adults. So depending on your, on your body weight and your size, you, you'll need more, less or more membrane surface area, okay? And uh, these are correlations then that we get uh, for this sort of work. And then uh, more we do reactive, non-reactive solutions, various ratios of glycerol and water. And this is for a, a hollow fiber blood oxygenator. And you can see here, there are 14,500 microporous polypropylene fibers, 200 plus or minus 30 micron ID, 300 plus or minus 30 OD, blood flows outside in this case. That's a lot of hollow fibers, okay, in a, in a small volume. And, and that's one of the big design criteria. And this is, again, the way we clot, clot this. So I'm sure for chemical engineers, you've seen clots like this. So I'm not going through the details of it, but that's typically how you'd analyze data using a non-blood system, and then you'd plot the data for blood there and see if you get a good correlation, okay? So I think it's 4.15, so I'm supposed to stop at that point. So why don't we stop there? I think uh, you know enough to be able to answer that question now. So to plan tomorrow is two of those questions you're going to do for homework because we are supposed to mark them tomorrow. And I think uh, Professor Jacob also gave some questions to them, right? So all of those you can turn in tomorrow. I will finish this lecture and then I'm going to talk about the last lecture in the bioseparations part. And then depending on time, we will finish uh, those last few topics, which was uh, uh, actually looking at hemofiltration, I said, and also there was one other one, right? Hemofiltration, and what was the other one I talked about? Um, just one second, let me get there. Actually, plasmapheresis, yeah, hemofiltration and plasmapheresis. Dialysis you have done already, okay? All right, that's it. See you tomorrow. Thank you. But don't forget to do the homework, because I think we have to mark it. That's what I was told. <laughs>